to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Cross Examines the New Testament with Rabbi Michael Skobach. Today we're discussing Colossians chapter 1. Rabbi, welcome back. It is good to be here with you. It is good to have you back here, for sure, no doubt. Suffering from those post Passover blues. <laughs> somebody said, <laughs> somebody, I got Mitch, one of my admins today during the show. Uh, he said, uh, um, he said, uh, happy Hametz. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, I thought that was awesome. Very funny. Happy Hametz. <laughs> yep. Time to get back into 11. <laughs> so very cool. Very cool. So yeah, so this is it. We're in Colossians. We're moving on. Yeah. We've got four chapters here too. So. We'll see how we'll see how all this goes. I'm sure it's gonna be quite informative. I love the title that you have chosen uh, for today, so that's good. I'm looking forward to what you've got to teach about it. So whenever I, you're... Get, I sent you three titles, I'm not sure which one you chose. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so the one that I picked was the first one. Let me go back and okay. just reread the as it pulls up. Okay, it says, uh, "Was Jesus the creator of the universe?" <laughs> okay, I love that. I want to find out. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, this is actually going to be a long uh, chapter for us, and I'm, I'm not sure we'll even finish it okay. to, uh, this time, but we'll try. Um, so basically, just by way of introduction, Paul wrote uh, Colossians about 30 years after Jesus uh, died. And it's important to realize that in his letters, Paul is often – trying to put out fires when he writes to his audiences. So in context, what you're reading, it's not really for generations to come, although, you know, the, the Christian editors assumed that the letters had eternal significance. But in context, Paul was really writing um, and he was addressing ideas and issues that were challenging at the time. And one of the things that we know is that Gnosticism was a tremendous challenge to the early church, and it had immense popularity and appeal. And one of the concepts, we're not going to be able to get into what Gnosticism is in general, but one of the concepts was that the world was created by um, the agency of vi different angels. And so the Gnostics basically saw Jesus as one of these angels. And um, this is an idea that Paul found to be difficult. And um, so there were other objections that Paul had to the Gnostics that he will address in chapter one, not just this question about whether Jesus was an angel or something else, uh, the Gnostics also rejected the idea of a bodily resurrection of Jesus. They insisted that he only came back as a spirit. And so these ideas were making inroads into the um, Colossian community. And that's exactly why Paul felt compelled to write this letter. Um, and really, this is really what we find to be true for all of his letters. They were all agenda driven. There was always an issue that compelled him to write these letters and he was always trying to put out fires. So we'll begin with, with verse one. I'll try to go verse by verse through this chapter. Um, Paul in verse one does something he's done many times in the past. He claims to be an apostle by God's will. That's, that's his assertion that by the will of God, he is an apostle. And um, he makes this claim frequently. And the question is, um, is this not just simply a claim um, with absolutely no proof? Meaning, what is the proof that God appointed him as an apostle? Um, he insists that God appointed him. And as church lady used to say, how convenient. <laughs> meaning that <laughs> right. basically it's 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 a matter of taking Paul at his word because there is no objective, um, credible proof that he really was appointed by God as an apostle. Um, and, and that's a problem because again, we know from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew scriptures, uh, 
that there was an objective criteria to validate whether someone actually was a prophet who spoke on behalf of God. And there really is no such mechanism in the Christian Bible. Um, and so, you know, this is Paul's, again, often made claim. Now, in verse 3, Paul makes reference to what he calls God and Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. So he speaks about God, who obviously, he says, is the Father of our Lord Jesus the Messiah. And on this phrase, John MacArthur, again, one of the most preeminent evangelical scholars today, he says that this passage, this phrase, shows that Jesus was one in nature with God as any true son is with his father. It is an affirmation of Jesus's deity. Now, the problem is, obviously, that if you look carefully at this phrase, when it says God and father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the phrase here distinguishes Jesus from God. And actually, we've seen many, many times in our previous sessions that in the Christian scriptures, Jesus is repeatedly distinguished from God. And Paul here says that God is the father of Jesus, not that Jesus is God. Basically, all Paul is saying here is that Jesus is son of God. Um, he could have said if he really wanted to make it clear that Jesus is God, he could have said God the Father and God and God the Messiah or God or the, the Son of God, something where he, he explicitly references Jesus as God. But the, the passage doesn't say that. And we know that in the Tanakh, we see God is constantly referred to as our Father, um, and that would not make us God. So I don't know why MacArthur feels that once this passage speaks about God as the father of Jesus, that means that Jesus is a deity, that Jesus is God, because we find throughout the Tanakh, God is spoken of as our father. Um, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, it speaks about Israel as being God's firstborn son. So if Israel is God's firstborn son, then God is our father. Um, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 6, and in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31, and in Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 1. It, again, it repeats this idea over and over that we are the sons of God. Um, and not just the people of Israel uh, in, in, as a generic, as a, as a group, but then individuals are spoken of in the Hebrew scriptures as the son of God and God being their father. A good example is 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, where God says, I will be his father. And the word his there is referring to Solomon. So here God is saying, I will be his father. And no one uh, even had for a moment a thought that Solomon should be considered a deity, that Solomon should be considered God. And we see this idea about Solomon reiterated, repeated in Psalm 89, verses 26 to 27. So this idea that once God is referred to as someone's father, that means that that person is automatically considered God is really not consistent with the biblical record. Moving on to verse three, um, in the ESV study Bible, it says about verse three that Jesus is not a separate God I'm sorry, I think that I, I'm still on verse three. We're, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to make it clear. We're going back to this phrase, um, God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. So on that phrase, the ESV study Bible says, Jesus is not a separate God, but he has a close relationship with the Father, for he is the son and agent of God. And so that's an important clarification. Because we know that in the Tanakh, in the scriptures, angels, for example, are all agents of God, but they're not to be confused with God. We're not to worship an angel. Um, to worship an angel, to worship any angel of God would be idolatry. Um, again, in the Hebrew scriptures, in the Tanakh, uh, 
we are only to worship the creator of everything that exists, never to, to worship a created being. And so when the ESV study Bible tells us, again, I don't know if we have to agree that Jesus is some kind of special agent of God, but they are making clear there that as an agent of God, he's not God. He's simply an agent of God in much the same way you could say that in the Tanakh, angels are considered to be agents of God. Um, you would never, God forbid, worship an agent of God. In verse 5, Paul speaks about the word of truth of the gospel, that the gospel is the word or the message of truth. And so we have to ask, I think anyone that's going to read these texts critically has to ask, what makes the gospel true? Um, is it just because the New Testament insists that it's true? I mean, again, that's the claim that Paul's making, that the gospel is the word of truth. But what is the evidence that the gospel is the word of truth? Again, all you have is the claim that's being made. Um, but the problem is that the facts don't back up this claim. Um, the major claim of the gospel is that Jesus was the Messiah. But it's pretty clear that if we um, have any understanding of what the Messiah is based upon the criteria and the definition in the Hebrew scriptures, Jesus was very clearly not the Messiah. Um, Christians are, all, are always forced to say that, well, all of the messianic criteria um, that the Hebrew scriptures have, meaning all of the prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures that speak of the coming of the Messiah, well, Jesus will fulfill those when he returns. Um, but again, he didn't fulfill them. And so to insist that Jesus was the Messiah before he fulfills any of the primary critical uh, prophecies and any of the primary critical criteria is just a fallacy. It's a falsehood. I mean, a Christian could say that, look, I believe one day that Jesus will return and then you'll see that he's the Messiah. Fine. We can discuss that when he returns, if he returns. But to insist now before anything has been fulfilled, that he is the Messiah is just uh, doesn't it doesn't really correspond to the facts. Number two, um, none of the writers of the Christian scriptures have been confirmed as prophets, meaning that, again, Paul is saying here in verse five that the gospel is the word of truth. But who wrote these gospels and how do we know that they speak on behalf of God? Who is the who validated them as Val, as prophets, um, and they were not confirmed, meaning that using the criteria that the Hebrew scriptures lays out for confirming prophecy, um, the writers of the, of the gospels did not pass the criteria of the Hebrew scriptures, I meaning that would be, if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 17, um, it makes it very clear there that you have to in order to be considered a true prophet rather than a false prophet, you would have to be approved by the leading Jewish sages at the time. And none of the leading Jewish sages accepted any of the gospel writers as legitimate or uh, uh, as significant. Um, number three, we're going to see later on tonight that one of the major messages of the gospels is that Jesus died for our sins. And again, there's no need, according to the Hebrew scriptures, to have Jesus die for our sins. Number four, um, you know, the Christians insist, and you'll find this in the Gospels, that there are numerous prophecies in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, that point to Jesus. But again, when you study those prophecies, you see that they're not speaking about the Messiah, and they're not speaking about Jesus. So you have so many flaws with this idea that the um, th that the gospel is the word of truth, meaning that, again, all you really have here is hype. You have here Paul insisting that it's truth. But if you try to go back to the standard, the gold standard, which is, does it really line up with the Hebrew scriptures? It doesn't in any way, shape or form. Um, going on to verse six. So. It says there that the gospel is bringing forth fruit. Um, and the commentaries all say that what this means is that the good news of the gospel changes lives. You hear this today 
um, you know, in every day from Christian preachers, you know, the changed lives of the gospel, um, you know, people that were um, enslaved to drugs, now they're living clean lives, and people that weren't faithful to their spouses are now faithful, you know, etc. And the truth is that um, this is irrelevant to speak about the importance. I mean, it's good that people's lives are changed, but is it is it spiritually significant to confirm the truth of the gospel? Absolutely not. Um, we know that every religion in the world and every philosophy in the world um, changes lives. And so does taking up sports, taking up exercise, dieting, meditation. There are so many things in the world that if you start doing them, um, it'll change your life and for the better. Um, but it doesn't prove that it comes from God. And that's the fallacy that really fa Paul falls into in verse six. We're going to jump over now to verse 13. And in verse 13, Paul speaks about the fact that Jesus delivered us. He delivered us. And um, one of the Christian commentaries I consulted is called the Reformation Study Bible. So there they say the following on this verse. They say that humanity outside of Jesus is helplessly under the power of darkness, the evil rule of Satan. Believers are rescued, delivered from this world order and brought under the dominion and protection of God's son. Um, of course, we've discussed this in the past. Um, humanity was never helpless and there was never a need to be rescued by Jesus. Um, going back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter four, verse seven, God tells us that sin will always lie at our door. T sin will always tempt us. But God says, this is not something made up by a rabbi. God says, but you can rule over it. You have the ability to veto. You have veto power over the temptation to sin. That's basically what Satan is. Satan is the tempter. And so for the Reformation Study Bible to say that outside of Jesus, humanity was helplessly under the power of darkness, under the evil rule of Satan, again, does not square with the clear testimony of the Hebrew Bible. It's interesting, by the way, that um, Christians are no better off than others in the world today when it comes to sin. Um, Christians, like everyone else in the world today, struggle with sin. Um, if you speak to any honest Christian, they'll tell you that, they'll admit that. And so um, what the Res Reformation Study Bible here seems to be saying is that, you know, it's those who have embraced Jesus that have been um, brought from under the dominion and protection of Satan into the um, protection of Jesus, and they've been taken out of the power of darkness. But in terms of facts on the ground, you know, show me the beef. It, it's just not the case that Christians um, share the same kinds of temptations and struggles with sin as any other person on the planet today. Um, so again, verse 13 does not pass the test of um, biblical truth. Moving on to verse 14, uh, Paul says in verse 14 about Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Um, David Stern in his Jewish New Testament commentary says the following. He says, this redemption is available from God only through his son, Yeshua. Now that. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to swallow what some of these Christian commentaries say, but it, to me, it's a little bit shocking to hear this kind of comment um, that for David Stern to say that redemption from sin is only available through God's son, Yeshua, Jesus. Um, it's really, it's impossible for me to understand a statement like this unless the person making it has literally ripped out the entire Hebrew scriptures from their Bible. Meaning that if David Stern now 
if his Bible, you know, consists only of the Greek Testament, I can see how he could say something like this. But if he has the same Bible, the same Hebrew Bible that I have, and it's part of his scriptures, I, I literally don't understand this. Um, first of all, there isn't one verse anywhere in the Tanakh that says anything remotely like what David Stern is saying. I mean, that you won't find any passage, not even one in the Tanakh, that even hints that the only way a person can be forgiven of their sins is by believing that God sacrificed his son and shed his blood on our behalf. Um, that you have to believe that in order to be forgiven for your sins and that God would send his son as the Messiah to do that. There's not one passage in the Hebrew Bible that even comes close to saying that. And the opposite, of course, we've seen numerous times on this show that this statement that David Stern makes totally ignores the very clear and consistent testimony of Scripture that we can be forgiven of our sins through teshuva, through repentance. Let me just share a few important passages, and I'll just make a little plug now um, for a booklet that I wrote on this topic that everyone can just download for free. The book is called You Turn with a exclamation point. Um, and it's basically the entire booklet is dealing with this topic of how we get forgiven for our sins. Um, so the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 33, verse 10, he raises this question, how do we get forgiven for our sins? He says, now you, son of man, Say to the house of Israel, Ezekiel is referred to as son of man in the book. So now you, son of man, God says to him, say to the house of Israel, thus you have spoken saying, since our sins and our iniquities are upon us and we are wasting away because of them, how can we live? How are we able to live in, in the presence of our sins? What do we do about our sin problem? And Ezekiel could have given the Christian answer. I mean, Ezekiel could have said, don't sweat. One day God will send his son and he will shed his blood. And if you believe in him, all your sins will be forgiven. Um, doesn't say that. What Ezekiel says in verse 11, the very next verse is, say to them, as I live, the word of the Lord God, I do not desire the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked one returns from his way that he may live. Repent, repent, repent from your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? So the question was raised, what do we do about our sins? And God answers directly, um, without stammering, you repent, and that's what you do. And this message is repeated over and over and over again, clearly and unambiguously in the Hebrew scriptures. Isaiah chapter 55, verse seven, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Um, in Jeremiah chapter 36, verse three, perhaps the house of Judah will hear all of the evil that I intend to do to them so that they will repent each man from his evil way and then I will forgive their sin and their transgression. Or in Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Or, um, again, I, I don't want to belabor the point because there are so many passages. Um, it's worth studying the entire 18th chapter of Ezekiel. We're not going to rehearse it now, but basically the entire 18th chapter of Ezekiel has the same message. Um, and many other verses back in Ezekiel chapter 33, I just quoted verses 10 and 11. But if you go to the rest of Ezekiel chapter 33, again, the same message. And the book of Job, he writes, if you return to God, you will be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tent, that's Job chapter 22, verse 23. 
Um, Psalm chapter 37, verse 27, turn from evil and do good so you will abide forever. Again, in this message, is repeated dozens and dozens and dozens of times throughout the Tanakh. So it's it's impossible for me to understand how David Stern just ha- writes something like this, that redemption from sin is only available through God's son, Yeshua. Um, moving on to verse 15, the Paul writes here that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And David Stern, in his commentary here, again, his Jewish New Testament commentary, says Yeshua, like Adam, is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus, like Adam, is the visible image of the invisible God. Now, the truth is that all human beings are created in the image of God, just like Adam was not God. No one, I mean, I don't think David Stern would say that Adam was divine, that he was God. Um, Just like Adam was created in the image of God, all human beings bear the image of God and we're not God. And Jesus was not God. Just because Paul says that he is the image of the invisible God, fine. So are you, William. (laughs) The good news and, and so am I, and so is every other person on the planet. Um, actually, not just human beings, all creation reflects God and testifies to God. But human beings are unique um, in terms of reflecting their creator. Um, how are human beings unique? Because we share certain unique characteristics with God that other creations don't have. For example, we are able to have abstract reasoning and thinking. Um, We have free will, free choice. Nothing else in the planet acts out of moral free will. Um, And also we, like God, can create. God creates and actually human beings are able to create. And that's why it's very interesting that when the Bible speaks about us, in the image of God. So we know that the Bible was not written in English and there are various terms in the Bible for God. We know that the major term, the specific term in the Bible for God is actually the four letter tetragrammaton, the yud Hey vav Hey. But the second most common term for God in the Bible is Elohim. And that's the name of God that's used in Genesis chapter one in the creation story. So when the Bible says that human beings are created in the image of Elohim, it's B'Tselem Elohim specifically. It never says B'Tselem in the image of yud Hey vav Hey. So why does it speak about us as being created in the image of Elohim? And one of the reasons is that just like Elohim was a creator, Elohim created everything. Human beings can create. And the question is, what do human beings create? So the answer is, we create ourselves. If you go back to Genesis 1, verse 26, when God created us, it says, let us make man. created naturally, just by speaking. God said, let there be light, let there be locusts, let there be trees, let there be lions and tigers and bears. But when it came to the human being, God says, let us make man. And the commentaries point out, especially the Hasidic masters, that God is really speaking here to every human being and saying, look, I cannot make you. All I can do is give you the raw ingredients. I can give you a body and a soul, but what you will become is a function of what you do with those raw ingredients. And so each human being is given the charge to create themselves. And that's why God says, let us make man. We become partners in effect with God in our own creation. And so that's why the Bible says that just like God is a creator, we are in the image of God. And we also are creators in that we create ourselves. Um, And it's interesting that in virtually all of the New Testament material that we've studied so far, it seems pretty clear 
that Jesus was not seen as God. I mean, we've gone through probably a hundred, if not more, passages where we've shown that the Christian scriptures always distinguish between Jesus and God. And at most, what we've seen is that the New Testament sees Jesus as some kind of intermediary to God. Um, now, I'm sure there are Christians who will insist that I'm wrong and that the passages in the Christian Bible, especially the one that we're in the middle of studying, especially this piece in Colossians, chapter one in Colossians, verses 15 to 20, they might insist that, no, you've misread everything, and this passage here makes it clear that Jesus is to be seen as God himself. Um, if that's the case, then unfortunately, this would be a very, very clear violation of the biblical prohibition against idolatry, meaning to um, give your loyalty and to commit yourself to anything other than the creator um, would be a violation of the Bible's dire prohibition against idolatry. And it's very clear that Jesus is a created being. Um, he breathes the same air that each of us breathes. And, um, you know, I find it unfortunate that there are still Christians who insist that Jesus is God. I don't think that they really have this belief because they really find it to be clearly taught in the Bible. I think that it's basically um, the conventional wisdom that they were taught to believe. Um, and, and it's interesting that when I speak to many simple Christians, you know, and I raise this question about whether Jesus was God, almost all of them say, no, he was just the son of God. I mean, they seem to instinctively understand there has to be a difference between Jesus and God. But uh, we're not going to solve this problem tonight. I just wanted to point out that so far, virtually everything we've seen in the Christian Bible has distinguished between Jesus and God. And at most, they, they have come to believe that Jesus is a special being who is an intermediary to God. Um, now, I'm less sure that passages like the one we're studying now um, are so clearly teaching that Jesus is God, meaning that Christians, you know, if they, if you get their back up against the wall and say, well, where do you see the Christian Bible teaching that Jesus is God? You know, there'll be a few that they will point to, and Colossians chapter one is going to be one of those places. Um, I'm just personally less sure that this chapter is clearly teaching that Jesus is God, as we'll see. Um, so we should bear in mind two things. Number one, in the Tanakh, it is clear that the Messiah is not God. For example, Isaiah chapter 11, which everyone agrees is about the Messiah, makes it clear that the Messiah is not God. It tells us the Messiah will be someone who fears God. Um, it doesn't say that the Messiah will be God. And number two, and I recommend that everyone does this as an exercise. If you go to the Bible, starting in Genesis one and read it, study it actually carefully to the very end and note, mark down every passage where it's clear from the context that the, that the, that what the passage is discussing in context is about God and his nature. It's not that hard to find such passages. Um, there are many. But if you were to go through all of these passages, um, we'll find that not even one of them even remotely hints to the idea of God being a trinity or that God will be, will be incarnated into human flesh. I mean, again, these are ideas that are just totally outside the framework of the Hebrew Bible. Um, moving on to verse 16, Paul says, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created through him and for him. Now, the ESV study Bible on this 
passage says the following, Jesus was the agent of creation through whom God made heaven and earth. Let me read that again. Jesus was the agent of creation through whom God made heaven and earth. This comment makes it very clear that Jesus was not the creator. God was. And God, according to Colossians, God used Jesus as an agent to create the world. But that doesn't make the agent God. That's the confusion here. And actually, if we look in the Hebrew scriptures, we see that there is a parallel idea to this. Um, it's actually, I'm not going to really mention this because it'll require a little bit too much explanation. But if any of the viewers has access to Rashi's commentary to the Torah, um, and there are English versions on Chabad.org, for example, they have an online Tanakh that has all of Rashi's commentary translated into English. So if you just look up Rashi's commentary to Genesis 1, 1, the very first verse in the Bible, so Rashi there speaks about the fact that the world was created through the Torah and for the Torah, through the Torah and for the Torah. And we actually see this in scripture. If you go to Proverbs chapter eight, um, it's, a, it's a big passage there. It's verses 22 to 30. So Proverbs chapter eight, 22 to 30, speaks about wisdom. Um, and this is understood as the Torah, as God's wisdom. Wisdom was the blueprint of the universe. It was the blueprint for the, for the creation of the universe. And it existed before the world was created. And the world was created through the Torah and for its teachings. Now, again, the Torah isn't God. It was the agent that God used in the creation of the Torah. But we don't worship the Torah. We don't confuse it with God. And that, unfortunately, has been the Christian error. Um, it's one thing for Christians to say that Jesus was the agent through whom God created the world, but that's not to be understood as saying that Jesus created the world. That would be an, an error. Um, in verse 18, Paul says that Jesus is firstborn from the dead. He's firstborn from the dead. And the Reformation Study Bible says the following, Jesus' resurrection marks the beginning of a new creation. As the first to rise from the dead, the Messiah inaugurates the new age anticipated in the Old Testament prophets and founds a new humanity in himself to replace the old humanity of Adam. Now, there are two problems here that I want to focus on. Problem number one is that Jesus was not the first to rise from the dead. That's just simply not true. Um, we know that Elijah the prophet in 1 Kings chapter 17, he resurrects the widow's son. And then in 2 Kings chapter 4, we see that Elisha resurrects the son of the Shunammite woman. And then in 2 Kings chapter 13, we know that after Elisha himself was buried, a corpse was thrown into his tomb, and when the corpse touched Elisha, he came back to life. He was resurrected. So we already see in the Hebrew scriptures a number of resurrections. And so to say that Jesus was the first to be ri risen from the dead, that's just simply a factual error. Now, John MacArthur, in his commentary to this chapter, tries to defend this idea by saying that Jesus was the first to be resurrected, never to die again. Meaning he would say that the difference is that those other people, after they came back to life, they died again, but Jesus did not die again. Now, the problem is that, again, this is simply an assertion. Um, we don't know this to be true. We don't know that Jesus did not die again. Um, you know, the fact that Christians believe he's living at the right-hand side of God somewhere in heaven I mean, we we believe, as many other people in the world believe, that 
many people who died, their souls are living in uh, the world to come in some kind of a soul world. And they are awaiting the resurrection from the dead in the future. But you could say equally that all people, or at least most people that have died and their souls live on, they're still living. So um, we don't really find any evidence that Jesus, after he was resurrected, never died again. Um, again, that's simply a belief that Christians might have. The second problem with the comment of the Reformation Study Bible is when it says that Jesus' resurrection inaugurated the new age anticipated in the Old Testament prophets is simply not true. I mean, there are numerous messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, many, Old Te many prophecies about the age of the Messiah, and none of them have come true yet. None of them have been fulfilled. So to say that with the death of Jesus and his resurrection, I, I would say alleged resurrection, um, anything really changed in terms of what the Hebrew Bible predicted about the future age is simply not true. He didn't inaugurate the new age anticipated in the Old Testament prophets. I mean, just the simplest example is that the Old Testament prophets, one of the things they anticipate is that the whole world will believe in God, every human being. That's not true. Hasn't been true since the death of Jesus. Um, we don't find that every human being knows God. The Old Testament prophets predicted that in the times of the Messiah, there'll be total peace in the world. All weapons of war will be destroyed and there'll be no more war, no more fighting. That's not certainly not true. Um, so it's just impossible for me to understand what in the world um, this commentary is, is really thinking about. Going on to verse 19, Paul says, for in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Again, referring to Jesus, for in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Again, I, I want to make it clear that for most Christians, this to them is a slam dunk, no brainer that this proves Jesus was God. Um, this, of course, does not make Jesus God. The fact that the the scripture here would say, that the, that the text here would say that God's fullness dwelt within Jesus. Now, again, I don't agree that that was the case. I don't think that, that Jesus contained any more God than any of us do. But again, taking the Christian Bible at its surface level, meaning just interpreting the text for what it's saying, to say that the fullness of God dwell the fullness of God dwells within Jesus does not mean that Jesus is God. For example, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 4, it says that God's presence filled the temple. That God's glory and his presence completely filled the temple, dwelled in the temple. We see the same thing in Exodus chapter 40 Verse 34, many times the Bible speaks about God's presence filling the temple. Um, of course, that doesn't mean the temple is God. We don't worship the temple, God forbid. So again, it's just the problem is that I think that um, the Christian reader of Paul's words doesn't necessarily understand the impact and the way these concepts might be understood in the Tanakh, um, to say that God's presence fills something in Tanakh is not an indication that the thing that's being filled is um, equal to God, is God. And on this verse, on verse 19, the NLT study Bible, the New Living uh, Translation study Bible says the following, God has chosen to reveal himself fully in the Messiah, Jesus. Seeing Jesus and understanding him means seeing and understanding God. The NASB study Bible says something similar on this verse, on verse 19. It says, no other intermediary, whether person or group, is able to stand in our place before the Father. Only Jesus can do this. But again, from this comment, you see 
that Jesus is an intermediary to God, but not God. An intermediary to God is not God. Um, the truth is, and this is very important to just bear in mind, we don't need any intermediary. We don't need any Messiah to get to God. We don't need this. Um, you know, Paul says here later on, we'll get to this in verse 22 in the chapter. Paul says that we are reconciled to God through the death of the Messiah. And this has brought you into his presence. The death of the Messiah has brought you into the presence of God. And again, this seems to be the assertion that Paul makes that through Jesus, we're able to get to God. This is the idea of Jesus being an intermediary, but there's no such concept mentioned anywhere in the Tanakh. Um, the Tanakh says, this is, I guess, one of the major messages that we can go straight to God. We don't have to pass go. We don't have to collect $200. We can go straight to God. We see this, for example, in Psalm 145, verse 18. God is near to all who call upon him. All you need to do is just speak directly to God. You don't need a middleman. You don't need an intermediary. You don't need a Messiah. Um, and this is how we know, I believe personally, this is how we know that the New Testament claim is false. This is probably the strongest proof against the claim of the New Testament. When the New Testament says, like you know, many of the commentaries say here, it's only through Jesus, the intermediary, that we can get to God. Or when in the Gospels it says no one comes to the Father except through the Son, we know this is not true. We know that Noah and Abraham and Moses and Samuel and David and Isaiah, they were all able to come to God and have a relationship with God without Jesus. We don't need Jesus. And I know personally for myself that I have a relationship with God and Jesus is not part of that relationship. I don't have any room in my heart for Jesus. I relate directly to the Almighty, to the Creator. And I don't have Jesus in my heart, and I don't need Jesus in my heart. And this, I believe, is the strongest repudiation of the New Testament claim. Um, verse 20 in this chapter, it says, through the Messiah, God reconciled everything to himself. Through the Messiah, God reconciled everything to himself. Again, this is a passage which to me makes it clear that the Messiah is not God. It's not saying that the Messiah is God, and if you're connected to the Messiah, you're connected to God. It's saying that through the Messiah, God reconciled, God reconciled, everything to himself. Meaning again, the Messiah here is simply a means to an end, is an intermediary. It's a tool, it's an agent, but not to be confused with God himself. In verse 21, John MacArthur writes, I mean, I've, I've dealt with a lot of what John MacArthur says in our classes, in our, in our studies together. Uh, his commentary to verse 21 it still leaves my head spinning, <laughs> literally spinning. I'm going to have to get a Maalox after this uh, program because it's unbelievable. He says the following. This is John MacArthur to verse 21. Before they were reconciled, again, this is through Jesus, before they were reconciled, all people were completely estranged from God. All people were completely estranged from God. Again, to me, this is absurd to say that Abraham and Isaiah and David, right? These are people without Jesus. They weren't reconciled to God, by, to, by, to God with Jesus. They didn't need Jesus to say that these are all people who were completely estranged from God, Moses. It's absurd. But then he goes one, 10 steps further and he says, unbelievers hate God and resent his holy standards because they love wicked works. <laughs> I find this to be so absolutely incredible. It boggles my mind. I don't even know if he himself believes this, that all unbelievers, that would include, you know, 
any Torah observant Jew, every Noahide in the world um, for all time, um, at least from the time of Jesus, let's say. These are people that hate God and we love wicked works. Please. Coming to the end of the chapter now, in verse 22, Paul says, You are now holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I guess through the agency of Jesus, right? You, Colossians, are now holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. I mean, I think, again, this is a little bit of hype. Um, I don't believe that we would say that none of the Colossians were committing any sins. Um, I don't believe that anyone would imagine that among the, the Colossians, all of their personality defects, like jealousy, have completely disappeared. So I'm not sure what Paul is referring to when he says that you don't have a single fault. That's certainly not what we see in the Christian world today. In verse 23, Paul exaggerates in this verse, just like many TV evangelists exaggerate today. Um, when he says the gospel um, has reached every creature under heaven. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I don't believe that when Paul was writing, um, this is around the year 60 of the common era, that the gospel had reached every creature under heaven. Um, probably it only reached a tiny fraction of humanity. Um, so this is a, 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 a quite an exaggeration. And then we'll end on verse 26. Um, Paul says in verse 26 about the mystery that has been revealed. So we know that throughout Paul's writings, he speaks about these mysteries that have been revealed. And basically, these are mysteries that were previously hidden and only now have been revealed. John MacArthur, in his commentary to this verse, says that these are mysteries that are not to be found, written about in the Old Testament. They're only now revealed John MacArthur says in the New Testament. And one of the mysteries that John MacArthur says is included in this verse is the mystery of the incarnate God. So again, this is certainly what Christians or some Christians believe that God became incarnate in Jesus. But I think what's significant about John MacArthur's comment is that he's saying this is a mystery that was not mentioned. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Now, this goes against, this flies in the face of what many Christian apologists insist. They say that, no, if Jewish people would only read the, their scriptures with an open mind and an open heart, they would see that it very clearly teaches about the idea of the Trinity. And it very clearly teaches about the idea that God would come to this planet in human flesh. Um, there was a book, many people know about this book, I forget the author, um, written by the J Witnesses called Why You Should Not Believe in the Trinity. And there was a response to this book written um, called Why You Should Believe in the Trinity. It was published by Baker House Books in 1989. And on page 22, he writes, all Trinitarians agree that the ideas about God expressed in the doctrine of the Trinity are not found directly in the Old Testament, to which I would say, amen, I would agree, that these are ideas that are not at all in the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, I question whether they're even clearly taught in the uh, Greek Testament, um, but again, that's up for debate. Um, again, I just would sum up by saying that it seems to me that if we read um, a chapter like this, which for most Christians, you know, for them, this is a slam dunk proving that Jesus is God and that Jesus created the world. Uh, I don't see it. I think that it's really reading more into the text than it, actually the text is saying. And uh, 
if I'm wrong about this, then, you know, it creates even bigger problems for the Christian Bible, um, you know, to come out and say that a human being was God that we should worship really transgresses the severe prohibition against idolatry. So um, it was a long, a long chapter. Um, we covered a lot of ground. And uh, God willing, next time we'll pick up with chapter two in Colossians. That sounds like a good plan to me, Rabbi. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that, that Colossians was so loaded with uh, with so much information. That's uh, yeah, it's pretty pretty insane. So uh, looking forward to next week for sure. So thank you guys for tuning in, Rabbi. Thank you for your time, and uh, we will look forward to seeing everybody uh, on the next show uh, one week from today, Hashem willing. So uh, you guys be sure and. Make sure you go to outreach. I say outreach gyms. Jews for Judaism. Ca. I had to say that because I, I realized after I had your ad up or your your name up, it didn't actually have your website on there. So I need you. Everybody knows your website for the most part and your channel on YouTube. Uh, but I just want to make sure that it did not get left out. So. Thank you, Rabbi. It's always a pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you. And also, for you people out there who are interested, there on your screen are some uh, counter-missionary books you will be definitely interested in. Um, OutreachStudiosm.org, you will find uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer's two-volume book set. Um, Jews for Judaism, I'm sorry, at, oh, golly, that's too much to remember, Rabbi. <laughs> I don't know what I'm thinking. Judaism, you, need, you need cue cards. I do. Judaism, it's actually on my screen. <laughs> Judaism and Christianity, a contrast by Rabbi Stuart Federal, revealing Matthew's secrets uh, by Jason LaCrosse and leaving Jesus uh, by James Wood Jr. All these are fantastic counter-missionary books. And, uh, and don't you, forget, oh, your turn. you know what? That's not, see, that's, to, that's, a, that's kind of a book. It's not really a pamphlet. What is up? Well, it's 50 pages. Hold, hold, that's okay. That's a book. Hold it up again, Rabbi. And where can we find that at? Uh, Jews for Judaism. That's CA. <laughs> okay. Is it? Uh, I mean, do we order it? Uh, do you just ask? No, for... it's you can download it for free. It's there for free. Interesting. Very cool. You turn. I like it. I like it. I like it. All right, Rabbi. Thank you so much. I really love your input. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. Okay. Shalom, shalom, everybody. Shalom. shalom. What is that? I'm hearing something else in the background. What is that? Two things I'm hearing. What is that? Go away. Quit it. Oh, that's funny. It's actually there's a video on the other computer of Rabbi uh, of Rabbi Federal, <laughs> and it's playing in the background. What is going on here? It's like there's a ghost in the machine. Hopefully, it's a good one. <laughs> see ya. You're hearing things. I am. <laughs> I'm hearing things. We'll see y'all later. Take care, everybody. Shum shum. Shove, <laughs> he